are so inspiring to me. And that is why I do what I do. When I hear stories about people, little babies and kids not being able to see, and you know, and then they can see, you know, that's so remarkable to me. Um, my story is a little bit different than a lot of the stories we've heard today. Um, I was diagnosed with Fanconi's anemia when I was 13 months old. And Fanconi's anemia is basically, it's the uh, genetic form of aplastic anemia, so it's a rare and fatal blood disorder. Um, when I was diagnosed, my parents were told that I would likely die before my 10th birthday and that my only chance for survival was with a perfect match sibling for a bone marrow transplant. Um, at that time, I was the oldest child, and with Fanconi's anemia, any other children that my parents had would have a one in four chance of also having FA. So, um, willing to do whatever it took to save my life, my parents decided to take the risk to try to conceive a perfect match for me to have a bone marrow transplant. Um, Two years later, uh, my sister Audrey was born, and Audrey was perfectly healthy. She didn't have FA, which was one battle that they surpassed, but Audrey was not a match. Um, still, you know, willing to do whatever it took, they kept trying, and a year after Audrey was born, my sister Emily was born. And this is when my parents were given hope. They were given hope for my survival. Emily was not only perfectly healthy, but Emily was a perfect match. She was a six out of six HLA match, which is basically like an identical twin born at a different time. While my mom was pregnant with Emily, um, she was put on bed rest because she went into preterm labor, you know, and all of her doctors knew how fragile and how valuable this little baby's life was. Not only was it, you know, another life, but it was also going to save my life. So she, when she was on bed rest, she was just, you know, being like any other expected mom and reading up on, you know, birth and what the whole birthing process was going to be like. And, you know, she realized, well, the umbilical cord has a lot of blood in it, and why would we just throw this away when it's Emily's blood that we're going to use for Natalie anyway? So um, she contacted some of her doctors, and basically their reaction was, you know, who told you about this? Because this was 19... 88, there was nothing published about cord blood being saved or preserved. There, was, there were no cord blood banks at this time, so nothing existed. So um, basically, with um, the help of a lot of other doctors and a lot of preparation, um, they decided that they were going to save and waste cord blood at the time of her birth. Um, doctors flew in from all over the country. There were 13 doctors and nurses in attendance. Um, it was a scheduled C-section, and um, it was the first cord blood collection in the world. And um, so, I mean, it's, it's pretty remarkable to say that cord blood saved my life. But what makes our story even more unique is I was diagnosed with kidney failure. Um, it was um, 2001, I guess, I was diagnosed with kidney failure. And um, inevitably, I would be a kidney transplant. So for um, about five years, I was um, stable. Um, in 2006, um, I had a kidney transplant. And Emily was my donor again. And since Emily and I had the cord blood transplant, I, I actually, that happened when I was four. And like many of you in this room, we had to travel overseas. Um, we went to Paris, France for our transplant. The transplant was a huge success. And, um, you know, but then back to the kidney transplant. So we had the one, kid, the one transplant in Paris, France. That was in 1989 was the cord blood transplant. Then in 2006, I had the kidney transplant. And the most amazing thing about all of this is that I don't have to take any anti-rejection medication. I don't take any medication associated with any type of procedure I've ever had. And that's thanks to the cord blood that Emily donated to me when she was a baby. So, I mean, and we still don't even know, doctors still don't even know, like with, when you have FA, you have a lot of other side effects that come with it. And you know, you're very prone to other cancers. And uh, so you have to be watched very closely. 
I haven't had any other complications in my entire life, so we aren't even sure what other complications could have, you know, been prevented due to the cord blood in 1989. So, I mean, only time will tell, and since I'm one of the oldest survivors, there's not really any way to measure whether or not that's true or not, but so far, so good, other than the kidney transplant, which wasn't, you know, couldn't necessarily have been prevented with the cord blood anyways. But, um, so in 2006, I had the kidney transplant from Emily, which, and no anti-rejection, I already said all of that. Next month marks the 21st anniversary from my cord blood transplant.